America's F-117 Nighthawk ushered in a revolution in air power. After decades of struggling to field higher, faster flying aircraft to defeat enemy air defenses, the Nighthawk proved that the future was stealth. But like the Nighthawk's covert beginnings, the 15 years since its retirement have been filled with whispered rumors. Some claim the Nighthawk was pulled out of retirement to see classified combat operations, while the Air Force claims it's being used as a valuable training tool. Let's cut through the static and see if we can figure out what the Wobbly Goblin's really been up to. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. All the way back in 1983, the F-117 Nighthawk entered service under cover of both darkness and classified funding. Its unusual angular design and cutting-edge radar-absorbent skin ushered in the stealth revolution that the F-117 itself oversaw for a quarter century until a new generation of even more capable stealth aircraft emerged and ended the Nighthawk's reign in 2008. But America's first stealth fleet was just too valuable to relegate to the boneyard, so a total of 52 F-117s were instead placed into what's commonly called Type 1000 flyable storage, which basically means they were pulled out of active service but kept ready to return to duty if the need should arise. And while the public was led to believe that America's black jets had flown off into the sunset, it wasn't long after that retirement that eyewitnesses started reporting seeing Nighthawks in the wild once again. In July of 2010, the first reports of F-117s in the sky after their retirement came in from over the Nevada Test and Training Range, which is the official name for a stretch of desert and military facilities that include the infamous Area 51. In November of that same year, these reports were backed up by photographic evidence when a YouTube account named The Nellis Spotter posted a one-minute video of a lone Nighthawk flying over Nevada. While more reports came in, they were largely ignored by people outside of aviation nerd circles like mine. That is, until images of Nighthawks operating out of the Tenapah test range hit the internet in early October 2014. Coverage of these images from noted journalists and big outlets with mainstream reach, like Tyler Rogaway at Jalopnik and David Senciati at The Aviationist, thrust the Nighthawk back into public view for the first time since its retirement. And all this attention forced the Air Force to address the topic, so Nellis Air Force Base spokesperson Master Sergeant David Miller gave a quote to the Las Vegas Review-Journal in late October of that year. I'll quote it here. Since its retirement from active flying status in 2008, the Air Force's cadre of F-117 Nighthawks has been maintained at their original, climate-friendly hangars at the Tenapa Test Range Airport in Nevada. In order to confirm the effectiveness of the flyable storage program, some F-117 aircraft are occasionally flown. Now, as you might imagine, this dismissive answer didn't quite sit right with everyone. Rumors and theories about the Nighthawks' continued service, in one form or another, soon began to emerge. One prominent theory that first popped up in 2014 was the idea that the triangular aircraft was kept flying just to provide plausible deniability for other black triangles prowling the skies over Nevada. After all, this is the region of the country that the United States has historically tested a number of classified stealth aircraft. I think this theory was most eloquently characterized by John Pike for global security back at the time. I'll quote him here. What I think is, the truth can be so precious that it must be protected by a bodyguard of lies. If I'm flying a big UAV bomber, and if someone catches sight of it, it can be explained away by the flight of the F-117A. There's nobody in here but us chickens. 
Of course, this wasn't the only theory. Others, like one from the aforementioned Rogaway, posited that the stealthy aircraft was a near-perfect and highly available low-observable aircraft to use in a wide variety of testing applicable to future stealth operations, both defensive and offensive. And what I mean by that is that you can use the F-117 to test new systems or materials for use in later stealth programs without taking an F-35 or an F-22 out of rotation. But likewise, you could also use the Nighthawk to test new defensive technologies meant to identify and target stealth aircraft. After all, despite being more than 40 years old, the F-117 still has a radar return that is, at worst, comparable and at best, significantly smaller than either Russia's Su-57 or China's J-20. So with rumors now swirling that the F-117 may once again be operating under the classified veil, it wasn't long before more reports of the Nighthawk surfaced online. In July of 2015, the website Lazy G Ranch published new photos of the black jet peeking out of its hangars at Tenapah and flying at low altitudes around nearby mountains. One year later, in July of 2016, the Aviationist published a video captured by a user named Sam Samama Mishman. All right, I'm pretty sure it's Sam Mishman. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. But the video showed two Nighthawks flying together over Tenapa. But while the majority of these sightings could be explained away by the Air Force's claims of just keeping these exotic aircraft in flying shape, there was about to be a massive shift in both confirmed and rumored uses of the F-117, now nine years post-retirement. On December 23, 2016, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017, something we usually just call the defense budget, was signed into law with a line item specific to the Nighthawk. Per the budget, four of America's remaining F-117s were to be demilitarized and divested from flyable storage each year to follow, finally sending the Nighthawk out to pasture nearly a decade after its active service came to a close. But while this decision seemed like an end for the famed stealth fighter that wasn't, this Lockheed legend was only beginning to grow. In fact, even this budgetary line item about demilitarizing and divesting four Nighthawks per year would soon look less like a sound budgetary decision and more like another layer of plausible deniability meant to cover up classified F-117 operations. In November of 2017, plane spotter Randy Williams filmed what very clearly appeared to be an F-117 being transported by a flatbed truck south of Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. Some theorized that this trailered Nighthawk was to be among the first to be stripped of combat systems for true retirement. But another claim that wouldn't surface until a few years later suggests something very different. And I want to be very transparent here that at this point in the story, we're going to take a step away from confirmed hard facts for a few minutes while we talk about claims made by the Dutch Aviation Society and their Scramble magazine. Because according to them, this F-117 or others like it weren't just trucking around Nevada and getting hours in over the deserts of the southwestern U.S. Oh no, instead, they were secretly headed back to combat. Now, Scramble summarized their claims in one concise paragraph, so I'll just go ahead and read it to you here. Back in 2017, and not published by any other source so far, Scramble received very reliable information that at least four F-117s were deployed to the Middle East, as an operational need emerged for the U.S. Air Force to resurrect the stealth F-117 for special purposes. One of the deployed aircraft was involved in an in-flight emergency and landed far away from its temporary home base that was likely located in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, or Qatar. During this extremely covert deployment, the four Nighthawks flew missions over Syria and Iraq with small diameter bombs. Now, this was hardly the first time the rumor mill about America's retired Nighthawks had suggested that the stealth jet may have returned to combat operations. But while previous tales were relegated to anonymous usernames and whispers across message boards, this was the first time a pretty well-established and fairly popular outlet had not only reported on them, but claimed to have its own reliable sources. 
Before we go any further, I know what you're thinking, because I'm thinking it too. At first pass, this claim seems almost silly. After all, despite the F-117's minimal radar and infrared signatures, the U.S. Air Force was already operating far more advanced and capable stealth aircraft by then. The Air Force's F-35As wouldn't see their first combat deployment for another two years, but the Air Force did have fleets of F-22 Raptors and heavy payload B-2 Spirits. Surely any mission the Air Force could be facing in Syria could be done, and done better, by these newer, stealthier, and more broadly capable platforms, right? Well, maybe not. And this is where this story gets really interesting, and why I decided to include it in this video, even though we can't confirm if it's true. Because there are actually a number of reasons why the F-117 may not only have been well-suited for combat ops over western Syria, but it may have even been a better choice than the more modern stealth jets the Air Force had at its disposal. But before I run through them, I need to give credit where it's due. While I did cover this story at the time, my beat at that stage in my career was actually foreign policy with a focus on the Pacific. I was obviously interested in aviation and defense technology, but that was sort of an off-hours thing that I would occasionally convince editors to let me write about. But by this time in 2017, the aforementioned Tyler Rogaway was already running the war zone, which is an excellent outlet. Reading his coverage of this story at the time framed this topic for me in such a way that any later suppositions or even conclusions of my own are all really built upon the foundation of his coverage. So I really can't run through the reasons the F-117 may have been well-suited for the combat operations in Syria at the time without crediting Ragaway's piece, let's talk about the rumor that F-117s have flown missions in the Middle East recently. Now, just like us, Ragaway was also skeptical of this story, and he emphasized in this piece that there was no publicly available evidence to substantiate it. But he also laid out a very convincing case as to why it could be true. And we'll get to that in just a minute, but first we need a little bit of context. In 2011, pro-democracy protests broke out throughout Syria against the sitting president, Bashar al-Assad, who had inherited the presidency from his father in the year 2000. His father held it since 1971. And while the nation did hold elections every seven years, those elections were internationally recognized as shams. Assad's regime responded to these protests with a great deal of violence, and before long, these protests erupted into a full-scale civil war. And that's when Assad called for reinforcements from the Russian military. Intent on squashing this insurrection, Assad's Russian-backed regime soon took the fight not just to rebel groups, but seemingly to civilians in mass. In just the first three years of this conflict, Assad was accused of using chemical weapons against his own people, mostly sarin or chlorine gas, no fewer than 22 times. And as opposition to Assad's rule grew in direct relation to his own brutality, it created enough instability within the nation by 2014 for an offshoot of al-Qaeda known as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, to gain a significant foothold. Before long, the threat from ISIS proved so severe that Syria's warring parties opted to temporarily postpone hostilities in order to purge the burgeoning terror group from each of their respective territories. For help in this endeavor, Assad turned to Russia and Iran, while the rebel groups collectively known as the Syrian Democratic Forces turned to the United States. An uneasy peace was established between Syrian warring parties and the third-party nations backing them by having respective groups operate only within their own controlled territory. But it was certainly more uneasy than it was peaceful. Tensions between parties were constant and often boiled over into isolated conflicts. In June of 2017, a U.S. Navy Super Hornet was forced to shoot down a Syrian Su-22 as it was trying to engage SDF forces in a town on the border between Kurdish SDF and Assad-controlled territories. 
In February of 2018, Syrian and Russian forces from the now infamous Wagner Group attacked another SDF position near their territory, this time one that just so happened to be occupied by 30 or so U.S. Army Rangers and elite Delta Force operators. Now, the U.S. troops may have been vastly outnumbered, but they called in for air support, and the resulting shooting gallery absolutely devastated the combined Russian and Syrian attacking force, leaving literally hundreds dead. Incidents like these all led to real concern that this Syrian conflict could escalate into open war between the U.S. and Russia. By 2017, Russian forces had placed air defense systems all throughout Assad-controlled western Syria, and the U.S. had few options if it wanted to chase a high-value target into their territory. A slow-moving and non-stealth drone like the MQ-9 would be at the mercy of Russian air defenses, so stealth seemed like the logical choice. But America's stealth platforms and service were not particularly well-suited for the job. The heavy payload B-2 Spirit stealth bomber was certainly capable of delivering ordnance with impunity over Syria with little concern about Russian air defenses, but it was limited operationally by other obligations, production volume, and its immense cost of operation. In other words, with just 21 of these bombers in existence, people would certainly notice a deployment to the Middle East, and if you wanted to fly them out of Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri where they're stationed, it would get prohibitively expensive very fast. The B-2 costs about $163,000 per hour to operate, and there's about 6,500 miles between Whiteman Air Force Base and Syria, which means it would cost just about $3.8 million per trip just to get the B-2 to the Syrian border and back. And that's without even considering other costs, like the tankers that you'd need to refuel them. This could all be worth it for one really important mission, but it's certainly not something you'd do regularly. Now, as I already mentioned, the F-35 wouldn't see its first combat deployment with the Air Force until two years later. But what about the F-22? It certainly had the stealth to operate freely in Russian-controlled airspace, but its primary air-to-ground munitions were GPS-guided weapons, like the Joint Direct Attack Munition, or JDAM. Now, these weapons are known for their precision, but they're very limited in their ability to engage moving targets, like, let's say, a vehicle transporting a terrorist leader on the run. The right weapon to leverage for this sort of job would be a laser-guided bomb, which takes its cues from a laser designator on the deploying aircraft. But there was a problem. The F-22 wasn't equipped to leverage this sort of weapon. In fact, there was only one aircraft in the Air Force's arsenal at the time with both the stealth and the ability to employ laser-guided bombs. I've got a feeling you know which aircraft that is, but this is where I need to credit Tyler Rogaway for this conclusion. I'll quote him here. The F-117 is really a flying laser-guided bomb delivery vehicle above all else. It was designed and built around this technology and concept of operations. And believe it or not, there were other upsides to using the Nighthawk for operations over Syria. For instance, if Russian forces somehow did manage to shoot one down, the F-117's dated technology would offer very little to America's opponents that they hadn't already learned from the Nighthawk that was shot down over Yugoslavia in 1999. And if the Russians were jamming GPS as they're known to do, that wouldn't matter much to Nighthawk pilots who train to navigate via inertial guidance and even to occasionally use their laser designators to measure the distance to known landmarks and geographical features to determine their relative location. And the F-117's slit exhaust ports for its pair of non-afterburning F-404 turbofan engines produced such a tiny infrared signature that it would really minimize the chances of these aircraft being detected even by Russian fighters equipped with infrared search and track, or IRST, capabilities. The crazy fact of the matter is, there may have been good reason for the Nighthawk to operate over Syria and other Middle Eastern nations right up until 2019, when the F-35 began its first combat deployments for the Air Force with laser guidance capabilities on board. And with the 2017 defense budget calling for the removal and destruction of four Nighthawks per year, the sudden disappearance of a small group of F-117s would have plenty of plausible deniability. And interestingly, it was confirmed two years later, in 2019, that at least 51 Nighthawks were still in America's inventory, despite that order to destroy four per year. 
But as interesting as all this is, before we switch back to hard confirmed facts, I want to reiterate one more time that this is all circumstantial evidence, and to date, there is no hard proof that Nighthawks have ever deployed to Syria or anywhere else for that matter since their official retirement in 2008. But whether or not the Nighthawk really did suit up for one last combat ride back in 2017, one thing is for certain. The platform saw a significant resurgence almost immediately thereafter, with a huge increase in both sightings and official acknowledgments of the F-117's use in the years that followed. In February 2018, several F-117s were spotted flying over Death Valley, and a year later, in February 2019, more Nighthawks were spotted flying over the Paramount Valley near Naval Air Warfare Station China Lake. Then, in December, one F-117 was spotted flying alongside four F-16 aggressors, squaring off against a combined training force of F-15s and F-22s over the Nevada Test and Training Range, seemingly as a part of the legendary U.S. Air Force Weapons School, which is sort of that branch's equivalent to the Navy's Top Gun. Then in August, a half dozen F-117s made their debut in the Air Force's massive air combat exercise known as Red Flag, once again playing the role of aggressors. In October, a pair of Nighthawks were spotted operating out of Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. And then in 2021, the U.S. Air National Guard acknowledged that they were using F-117s to simulate airborne cruise missiles, sending out their F-15s to hunt the aircraft down in simulated missile defense drills. And then in January of last year, an incredible chrome-plated Nighthawk was spotted flying over the saline military operating area on the border between California and Nevada. Similar coatings have also been spotted on F-22s and F-35s, and although no official explanation for this chrome plating has surfaced so far, theories range from a means to counter IRST systems to a new form of radar-absorbent coating. And then, in September of last year, the Nighthawk really broke cover when the Air Force Test Center released a Request for Information, or RFI, about F-117 maintenance and logistical support. This document clearly states in no uncertain terms that the Air Force is looking to support continued Nighthawk flight operations until at least 2034. That's more than a decade from now and more than 50 years from when the Nighthawk originally entered service. And while it seems unlikely that the F-117 has seen combat since its retirement, and even more unlikely that it would see combat again, one thing is for certain. The F-117 Nighthawk is still flying, and it will be for a long time to come. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below, and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.